Texas class on Tuesday. I thought he gave a real tour de force. Um, what you get, what you got there, was a very cutting edge approach to how you make uh, good economic choices. Um, you will not get anything like that in a standard economics textbook, which is why the textbook has not yet been written. But uh, it's a very experimental approach, and uh, I thought he did a phenomenally good job. And I hope uh, you all, I think you would probably all agree with me. All right, uh, let's get started. So I want to follow up today on what Professor Sachs was talking about on making good economic choices and rationality and also to follow up on what I spoke last week about the, the Christian and Aristotelian traditions. So what I really want to do is I want to contrast two different approaches today, two different philosophical and practical approaches. One is how ra rational choice theory as seen by neoclassical economics, which comes out of utilitarianism. And secondly, the kind of high synthesis of the Christian and Aristotelian traditions that we see in Thomas Aquinas. And I think uh, I, I, I decided to do it this way because I thought it would make a really interesting contrast to see how these two traditions view rational choice and what that means. But to do that, we need to start with what is, we need to spend a few minutes saying what is utilitarianism because the, Neoclassical economics, as traditionally taught, comes out of utilitarianism. Now, if you pick up an economics textbook, you won't find any detailed discussion of utilitarianism because it's kind of, a lot of economists, it's always on the back burner. A lot of economists don't even realize how deeply rooted this tradition is in the utilitarianism, which comes from philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and, and John Stuart Mill. So I'll start. Uh, first of all, let me do something here. Let me speak of you. Let me let me share my screen. So I, okay, just give me, give me one minute. Of a, uh, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Okay. So here we go. Oh. Number two, modern economics for sustainable planet. So I want to talk about what is utilitarianism today. Utilitarianism is basically one of the major approaches to moral philosophy and ethics. And Last week, we talked about Aristotle's approach to that, which is really about living a life of reason and virtue. Uh, it's, about it's about forming good character and good citizens, uh, training to be good and make good choices. Um, utilitarianism comes from a different tradition called consequentialism. And consequentialism, as the word says, assesses actions by looking at the consequences. If the consequences are good, then thumbs up. If the consequences are bad, thumbs down. So you're not looking at character. You're not looking at motives. You're looking at consequences, outcomes. And that's really what neoclassical economics does. It looks at the outcomes. But it's much deeper than that. The most famous variety of consequentialism is called utilitarianism, which says, and it's very simple, uh, very, very simple idea. It says the right action is that which produces the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So that's the punchline here, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Um, Jeremy Bent, this is associated with a philosopher called Jeremy Bentham. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of quotes from Bentham just to see um, what he's doing. Jeremy Bentham says, we're governed by two sovereign masters, pleasure and pain. So you can see that quote there. Let me, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we shall do. So for Bentham, you want to maximize your pleasure and minimize your pain. Um, 
any appeal to anything else, Bentham says is nonsense on stilts. So that phrase you often hear, nonsense on stilts, which has become a very popular phrase, comes from Jeremy Bentham. And he was basically saying that, you know, if you look at human nature, it's very simple. You want to maximize your pleasure and minimize your pain. That's how you get the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But there's another implication of that. And if you look at the second quote, the community is a fictitious body composed of the individual members who are considered as constituting, as it were, its members. The interest of the community then is what? The sum of those interests of the different members who compose it. So the greatest happiness of the greatest number means you add up the happiness of all the individual people. You just add them up, you know, and you, Bentham thought that you could find some kind of ranking uh, of how happiness people were. You, you could, we call it utility. And that's what, that's what neoclassical economics does. You saw this from Professor Sachs last week, but this is where it's coming from. And if you can see straight away, there's no common good here. Bentham is saying very clearly that the community is a fictitious body. All you have is individuals looking to, max, to, to get as much pleasure and as little pain as possible. And then you, you, you maximize, the, you get the greatest happiness of the greatest number by adding up everybody's individual utilities. So that's Jeremy Bentham. By the way, Jeremy Bentham was quite mad. Uh, he had a very high opinion of himself. And, um, you know, when he died, he had himself stuffed um, and he still exists in that form. And every year they have a meeting of the Jeremy Bentham Society and they bring in the body of Jeremy Bentham and they um, and they and he is recorded as present but non-voting. Um, that's actually a true story. Uh, he's still he's still uh, he was quite mad, as, as I said, and, uh, and uh, his followers are kind of a bit mad, too. But uh, that's just a side story. Hang on, why won't that work? Okay, now. And by the way, so I, I, I give you an, so for example, Bentham in the, his ideas took really took root in, the, in 19th century England. A lot of Charles Dickens's novels about the cruelties of Victorian England under the Industrial Revolution are a veiled critique of utilitarianism and Jeremy Bentham. In fact, if you read his book, Hard Times, um, about the fictitious place called Coketown, Hard Times is basically a, a, a trenchant critique of utilitarianism, quite explicitly, actually, about what utilit how bad utilitarianism is. Um, for example, Bentham argued that you should basically put all beggars in the workhouse. Um, and you might ask, well, how does that maximize the greatest happiness of the greatest number by rounding up uh, homeless and putting them in workhouses? Well, Bentham's argument was quite clever. Bentham basically says, well, if you're a cold-hearted person, then you don't like seeing homeless people in the street. They annoy me. So therefore, they should be put in the workhouse so you can't see them. But if you're a tender-hearted person and the sight of a homeless person makes you feel bad about yourself, then the fact that you don't see them is good because you can walk down the street and you won't feel, you won't feel bad about yourself. Therefore, it maximizes the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And of course, it's not maximizing the happiness of the homeless people, but they're a sufficient minority that they can be ignored, that they can be sufficiently ignored. Now, you might think to yourself, hang on a second, this sounds a little bit fishy. And automatically we're seeing there one of the major weaknesses of this utilitarian framework, which you'll see very clearly when we come to neoclassical economics, is that it can exclude people. If you're adding up, if you're adding up uh, people's utilities or happiness, then you know, if, if, if one person is a zero, well, it doesn't really matter if everybody else has, is, is, is a 10 or a 20. Um, you can basically exclude people. Um, the old idea of the common good that we talked about when we talked about Aristotle last week prohibits the exclusion of people. Remember, it's the, common, it's the good that's common to us all 
that can't be divided into individual goods. And what Bentham is doing, as you saw from the quote, is very explicitly dividing it into individual goods. It's taking our utility and adding it up. So then you have John, John Stuart Mill followed Bentham and he gave a much more nuanced and sophisticated view of utilitarianism. He said that happiness is the ultimate end of human conflict, sorry, conflict, conduct, the ultimate end of human conduct and the standard of morality. And happiness is pleasure and the absence of pain. So Mill said, um, Bentham got that right. Happiness is pleasure and the absence of pain. Though he was more nuanced than Bentham, he divided pleasures into higher order and lower order pleasures. And he, he understood that this is more of a long-term view. In the short term, your immediate pleasures and pains, you know, this utilitarianism might not be the most apt description of what's going on, but in the longer term it is. And Mill was very famous for his promotion of liberty, you know, uh, freedom and liberty. And he argued that liberty in the long run was the best political system that would respect the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Uh, quite simply because you're letting people be free to pursue their own ideas of what's good and to pursue their own happiness. Think of the U.S. Um, the U.S. dictum of uh, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, you can see very clearly um, this was before Mill, but that, it's that was very much in the zeitgeist of what that meant. Now. If you think about this, the question for you is, okay, Aristotle talked about happiness. Utilitarians are talking about happiness. Are they talking about the same thing? And the answer is most definitely not. Remember for Aristotle, happiness was eudaimonia. It was human flourishing. It was about becoming the best version of yourself by actualizing your potentials to do good and to fulfill a lifelong quest to become excellent uh, and exercise the virtues through reason. So that was happiness for, Arist for Aristotle. So if you like, there could be, there is an objective notion of the good. If you think that say, you can be happy from taking drugs, um, Aristotle would say that's false happiness. That's not real happiness. That's a no, that's that's that, that that that's that's false. That's that's a bad. But for 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 Bentham and the utilitarians, happiness is hedonistic. It's really about pleasure and pain, uh, and it's whatever gives you pleasure and whatever removes your pain. So it's a very different view of um, of of of. Uh, of, um, I'm trying to do something here, of happiness. I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute because I want to ask you a question. Okay. I want to ask everybody a question. Um, so if you can possibly be on video for this, though, uh, if you can. Um, so the philosopher Robert Nozick basically a libertarian philosopher. We will come across him later when we talk about libertarianism. But he came up with this very interesting experiment. He basically said, imagine you had this machine and if you attach yourself to this machine, it would give you pleasurable stimuli for the rest of your life. You would, be in, you would, you would, you would feel the maximum pleasure you could from anything you, you wanted. But the catch is if you attach yourself to this machine, you can never unattach it. This is your life from now on. And his question was, who would take that deal? Who would hook themselves up to this pleasure machine? So if you can, let's do the, the little hand reaction. Put your hand up if you would attach yourself to that machine. I see no takers. Why not? Anybody wanna, anybody wanna hazard why not? Erica, you have to unmute yourself, yeah. Actually, I think I've heard this I scenario can't hear also. You. Can you hear me now? Still can't hear you. Can everybody else hear Erica? I oh. can hear you. I don't know what's wrong with my sound. Sorry. 
Maybe put it in the chat. Sorry, we're, we have to deal with these technological issues, unfortunately. Can you hear me or still no? I can't, I, I can't hear Erica. I don't okay. know. Uh, I can let's hear. put it in the chat if we can't hear each other, what you wanted to say. Can you hear me, Jeff? Hmm. Yes. Thanks, Jesse. Thank I you. don't know. Uh, you can all hear me, right? Hmm. Yes. I don't know what's going on then. Um, Jesse, say something so I can see if you're... Hey, can you hear me? Ah, try unmuting my sound on MacBook. Okay. Okay. Er Erica, talk now and see does that work. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Go ahead. So I was... I was saying that I have heard the scenario before in a different class. And I remember our conversation was like, if you if you're constantly feeling pleasure, you won't know what not feeling pleasure is. So you always feel like normal. You're never going to know what's ups and downs. You won't right. know the difference. Right. So what you're basically saying is you can't experience what it is to be human. Right. And I think that's that's right. I think Erica has has hit the nail on the head. Nobody wants that deal because we know that human life is much more than just, just achieving pleasure. It's about, you know, it's about your relationships, your friends, your job, your purposes, your community. In other words, I would argue um, that it's more about eudaimonia than it is about hedonistic views of happiness. And I think Nozick's little simple experiment shows very clearly where utilitarianism goes wrong. Now, we're going to have to grapple with this when we come to neoclassical economics, because neoclassical economics says you get pleasure, but how you get pleasure in a very specific way. You get pleasure from utility and you get utility from consuming goods and services that you can buy on the market. Um, and let's be honest that, you know, buying things on the market does give you satisfaction. You know, we material things do bring satisfaction but it's not all there is to life. In other words, you can't, shop, you, you can't shop your way to heaven, as somebody once said. Now, another issue with, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing now, and thank you, I'm sorry about that little technical glitch. I realized Jesse was right, I needed to unmute my sound on the MacBook. I muted my sound because every time I got a text or an email, it was like right in my ear, so I wanted to get that out. All right, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing. So one issue with another issue with utilitarianism, besides being hedonistic, is it can lead to massive exclusion and inequality. So think about this. You know, who are, who are included in the greatest happiness of the greatest number? How do you even measure it? Is it the greatest total? Is it the greatest average happiness? What does that mean? And who is included? Like already we saw from the little Bentham experiment that you can exclude beggars and the homeless. I mean, can you exclude minorities? Can you exclude women? What about animals? Do we take animal suffering into account? There's a lot of unanswered questions when you come to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, here's a little thing that I wanted to talk about. In neoclassical economics, out of utilitarianism, we have the idea of something called diminishing marginal utility. Diminishing marginal utility says that as you get more of something, your extra jolt of happiness or utility you get diminishes. Think of your eating ice cream. You know, your first bowl of ice cream is delicious. Your 10th bowl of ice cream is probably not so delicious. You get, uh, dimin that's, that's diminishing marginal utility, that as you consume something or as you get something that gives you pleasure, the pleasure you get diminishes with every marginal increment. And, you know, remember Bentham thought that this could be measured. We can measure what this utility is. Um, now, if you take that and you also make the assumption that you can compare utility across people, that's going to be a crucial assumption. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But let's assume now you can. Well, this actually has very radical implications. Because let's say you have 
a homeless person and a billionaire. If you take $100 from the billionaire and give it to the homeless person, you could easily say that the greatest happiness of the greatest number, ha overall happiness is up. Why? Whereas a billionaire is not even going to notice $100, but a homeless person is going to have a lot of use for $100. So overall happiness goes up. Well, let's keep going. Let's give another $100. Same thing. Let's give another $100. And you can keep going and you can, you can get to a position of very radical equality with this. You can see where this is going. It can lead to very radical equality. Now, Mill being, a, sorry, Bentham being a creature of his time, recognized where this is going, but he basically brushed it off by making a kind of a supply side argument saying, well, the rich would rebel and society would collapse. But he didn't really give a convincing um, argument as to why radical inequality uh, should be ruled out. Now, but then you might say, hang on a second. If neoclassical economics is rooted in utilitarianism, doesn't that lead to radical equality? And the answer is no, not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. And the reason is it does something very um, subtle, but radical. And it says, it does something very subtle by saying, we keep diminishing marginal utility as an assumption. That's fine, we keep that, you, you expect that. As you consume more of something, you get less happiness from it. But we rule out the fact that you can make interpersonal comparisons of utility. We rule that out. So you can't basically say the homeless person is happier than the billionaire after this transfer. And we'll, I'll explain why in a couple of minutes when we get to neoclassical economics. And the reason is everybody has their own utility functions and their utility comes from what they buy on the market. For, your utility comes from what they buy with their own money. Um, it's that simple. It's not, you know, you're, not compare, you're no longer comparing across individuals. So you're ruling out the kind of implicit radicalism that you had in, in early Jeremy Bentham. So you can no longer take money from the billionaire. So, but remember, it's radical in a bad way too, because utilitarianism can, can fail to respect human dignity. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of consequentialist or utilitarian reasoning. When people, and this is not, this is not an economic argument, but I think it's, it, 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 it draws the point out. When people talk about in 1945, when the US bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, launched the only country in the world which ever launched nuclear weapons and killing a massive amount of people. The only, the main justification for that was, well, that ended the war right then and it saved millions more lives that would have been killed had the war continued. That's a consequentialist argument. That's basically saying the morality is looking at the consequences or it's looking at the greatest happiness of the greatest number because if, you, if you're measuring it in terms of lives saved or lives lost, then dropping the nuclear weapons is the right course of action to do. But in the sense that that makes us queasy because it makes us queasy because, um, well, because you're dropping a nuclear weapon and you're killing innocent people. And this is part of the problem with consequentialism. It can disrespect human life and human dignity uh, in many ways. Uh, and the great Catholic philosopher called Elizabeth Anscombe basically wrote a, a very strong piece against the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By, by She was a virtue ethicist and she criticized this kind of consequentialist reasoning. Now, there's a little experiment that we can do. Um, let me stop share again. How many of you have heard of the trolley problem? Okay, a lot of people have heard of the trolley problem. How many of you have heard of the trolley problem from watching The Good Place? Okay, yes. The Good Place, by the way, is a brilliant comedy about moral philosophy, and it had a hilarious episode on the trolley problem. So I'm going to ask you, to solve the trolley problem right now. So let me, let me reshare my screen and show you my trolley problem. So here's the trolley problem. So there's a trolley coming along 
And on one track, there's one person tied up. And on another track, there's five people tied up. Now, if the trolley continues, it's going to kill the five people. But that's you standing with the lever. And if you push that lever, then the trolley gets diverted to the other track and the one person is killed and you save the five lives. That's the trolley problem in a nutshell. Now, with a show of hands, how many of you would pull that lever? One, two, three, four. How many of you would not pull the lever? One. So we have, we have some consequentialists, I would say some consequentialists here. And basically, if you're a consequentialist, you pull the lever because you're saving five lives uh, as opposed to one life. Um, that's consequentialist reasoning. And it's pretty powerful. It's powerful logic. Um, okay, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you any more questions so you can, uh, you can put your cameras back on. <laughs> Um, so that's the trolley problem. Uh, watch The Good Place if you haven't seen it. It's, it it's, it's kind of brilliant. Now let's talk about, oh yes, I wanted to talk about one more thing uh, about this. About how, about, and this is um, Peter Singer, who is basically a very famous modern utilitarian. He's at Princeton. And he basically looks at how radical utilitarianism can be from the good side. And he, are, he, he presents this, and then again, he presents this little experiment. He says, you have fancy new shoes and you're walking out in these new shoes. You cross by this little this lake and you see this little girl who's drowning in the lake. Now she's close enough that you can pull her out of the lake, but you're going to ruin your new shoes. What would you do? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you that, that question. What would you do? Well, Peter Singer's argument says, of course, every single person would say, of course I'd save the girl from drowning if I could. Shoes, the hell with the shoes. They're just shoes. And then he says, okay. But imagine now, instead of the new shoes, it's your income you're talking about. And instead of the girl drowning in the lake, it's a girl starving to death in one of the poorest countries in the world. Well, Singer's argument was, if you, were, if you say yes, I would sacrifice my new shoes to save a drowning girl, why is that different from sacrificing some of your income to save somebody from poverty in, the, in one of the world's poorest countries in the world? And it's a very powerful argument for the alleviation of poverty. And it's a utilitarian argument because it's based on the greatest happiness of the greatest number that you don't need your income as much as some of the poorest people in the world. And Peter Singer has a book on this called Effective Altruism, where he argues that you should basically get a job that makes as much income as possible so you can use that income to do good in the world. Now, that can be, that, that can be criticized as a philosophy, but it's a very powerful argument. Um, okay, uh, that's utilitarianism. Let me reshare my screen running a little behind, but we're having too much fun with the trolley problem. Rational choice theory. Now you saw a little bit of this last week, sorry, on Tuesday with Professor Sachs, when Professor Sachs introduced utility functions. Um, you are, rational choice theory is based on utilitarianism and it says you maximize your utility your preferences or your subjective satisfaction. The word subjective tells you that it's based in a utilitarian ethics. Now you don't measure this directly. You don't get say, some people say utils or jolts of satisfaction. You don't measure this directly. You measure it indirectly through what you can buy on the market. So as you saw with Professor Sachs, the utility function is the relationship between the consumption bundle and your total utility, and it's subjective. You make choices based on what gives you the best satisfaction. You maximize your utility, so that's clear. It assumes 
diminishing marginal utility, which we already saw from Bantham. So in other words, the additional satisfaction you get from consuming one more unit of a good or services declines as your consumption increases. But here's the key. As long as you get some positive marginal utility, you don't get satisfied. Remember from Professor Sachs when he drew that line, the only thing that stops you consuming more and more and more and more and more and more and more forever and ever is your income. If you had more income, you would consume more and you would be happier. So in other words, your utility is only bounded by your income or by your time or things like that. But if you weren't bound by your income, then you would never get satisfied. In other words, uh, you would, uh, your utility would, would keep on increasing if you, with, 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 with goods and services. Now, with that, this is often called, you use money to show preferences. That's often called the measuring rod of money. You reveal preferences when you choose what to buy and sell on the market. That's the essence of rational choice theory in neoclassical economics. And why is it rational? Well, that's very specifically. Rational is you respond consistently and logically to changes in incentives to get the best outcomes you can given, con given constraints. You use the money you have to best satisfy your preferences. You know, I like cake more than I like vegetables. Therefore, I'm going to use my money to buy more cake and less vegetables. That's rational, right? That's rational. If the price of cake rises, I'll buy less cake because price, if my income goes up, I buy more of every, right? That's rational. You're responding to changes in income and in prices and other things to best satisfy your preferences and your preferences are goods and services you can buy on the market. And um, this, by the way, if you do a traditional economics course, this is how they derive supply and demand curves. We're going to argue that you don't need this baggage to show supply and demand. Supply and demand has existed since the dawn of human civilization, but rational choice theory is only 150 years old. Uh, you don't need this to have supply and demand, but you can derive it. And if you've done traditional microeconomics, you'll have seen this. You have your utility functions and your indifference curves and your budget constraints, and you, you can derive it. But we don't need to do that because that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about a different approach to economics. But it's important to know what neoclassical economics says. So basically, at this, at the, at this equilibrium of supply and demand, then everybody who's willing and able to buy at that price can do so. And everybody who's will enable, willing and able to sell at that price can do so. You are satisfying your preferences. You're, you're getting the maximum satisfaction. If you choose not to buy something, it's because you take your money and you buy something else that's more valuable to you, that gives you more utility. It's the same for sellers. If you choose not to sell, I can take my resources and make something that's more valuable than this particular product. Everybody is satisfying their preferences and everybody is able to buy and sell. Uh, is a, anybody who wants to buy and sell at a given equilibrium price can do so. That is the essence of uh, neoclassical economics. And that gives rise to something called Pareto efficiency that in this equilibrium, this competitive equilibrium, this market equilibrium, you exhaust all voluntary trades that can satisfy preferences, whether you're buying something or, you, or using your resources in production. Um, you can't make somebody better off without making somebody worse off. Aha! Go back to the example that we talked about of the billionaire and the homeless person. Now, if you take $100 from the, the billionaire to give to the homeless person, well, you're making the billionaire worse off by $100. So 
that is not a Pareto improving uh, transfer. So neoclassical economics would rule that out. So what economists would say is, they're not, they're not so cold hearted. What they would say is, well, if you want to redistribute income, you can do that, but that's a political choice. Economics is about efficiency. So there's this, there's this dichotomy between efficiency and equity. If you want efficiency, you can't make one, somebody better off without making somebody worse off. But if you want to do that, then you have to appeal to a different principle, a political principle. So this is often seen as scientific. If you talk, about, if you talk to economists, they'll often say this, well, this is scientific. It's Pareto efficiency. It's free of ethics. But is it really free of ethics? Think of a couple of Pareto improving trades. Let's say that a situation that many people have faced, pre-COVID anyway, you have a flight that's full and there's only one seat left. Um, and there's a student on that flight who has plenty of time. And the airline says, there's this rich businessman who needs to get to an important meeting in London. The flight's going to London. And, he, and it's all sold out. He says, and they ask the student, if we give you $1,000 or a coupon, will you be bummed from this flight and take the next flight? The student is happy to do that because the student has plenty of time. The businessman needs to get to London. That's a Pareto improving trade. They're both made better off. The student gets $1,000 and is happier and the businessman gets to make his or her meeting. His meeting, because I said businessman. Um, that's Pareto improvement. But let's say that it's not a student with all the time in the world. Let's say that it's a, a person who is, doesn't have much money, but who's going to see a sick parent across the, across the world and needs to get there very quickly. Well, if you use the measuring rod of money, then clearly the businessman is going to be able to pay more for that extra seat. And the person doesn't get to see his sick, his or her sick parent. Um, so that's why Pareto efficiency can lead to outcomes that are deemed unfair or unethical. Um, and this is why, I don't know if many of you have heard of Amartya Sen. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's a brilliant mind. He's a, he's a, He's one of those rare creatures who's both a top level economist and a top level philosopher. And he argued that an economy can be Pareto efficient and perfectly disgusting. He used the term perfectly disgusting. And I think that tells you the moral limits of Pareto efficiency. So this is why that when we talk about making good economic choices, we want a, a broader idea of what the good is, a good that's more holistic, uh, more, uh, more includes more people and, uh, and doesn't uh, disrespect uh, human dignity. Let me now move on to Thomas Aquinas. And this is shifting gears a little bit, but I think it makes an interesting contrast with what we were talking about. And I might not get through all of this today, and th that's fine. Um, but I think, and I'm sure a lot of you who've at Fordham who've taken classes before, maybe in theology, have studied Thomas Aquinas. So I really, what I really want to do is focus on what Aquinas' implications are for the market. And here I would appeal, there's some of this, there's a short, there's a section I wrote in this in my Cathonomics book, which is in your, um, on, on, on the blackboard. There's also a chapter, a couple of chapters I dropped in there from a book by Mary Hirschfeld, who wrote a book called Aquinas and the Market. I think it's an excellent book. It's a scholarly book, so it's not always the easiest read. But for those of you who are interested, it gives a fantastic overview of what Aquinas had to say on these topics and how you can apply the thinking of Thomas Aquinas to the market. And Mary Hirschfeld is an economist herself. She's an economist and a theologian. She has two PhDs. And she basically, her goal is to, is to contrast, just like we're doing, rational choice theory in neoclassical economics 
with the thought of Thomas Aquinas. So this is a very relevant book if, if, you're, if you want to delve deeper into some of what Aquinas said. My simplistic beginning is Thomas Aquinas' Aristotle meets Christianity. So he takes Aristotle and adds God it would be a very simple way of, 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 of looking at it. And this is a twofold structure of happiness. Happiness, true happiness is the highest end, the supernatural end, which is union with God. But there's also a natural end, which is synonymous with Aristotle's eudaimonia. So there's happiness in this world through ex living a life of virtue and reason, which is basically eudaimonia. Um, and there's also supernatural, sorry, there's also happiness through union with God, that's the supernatural end. So there's the natural end and the supernatural end. He, to, get, to understand this more, we need to understand what Aquinas meant by intellect and will. The intellect is the capacity that allows us to know what is true and good, and therefore inclines us to seek what is true and good. We discern what is good by using the intellect. The will is once you discern the good with the intellect, you desire the good with the will directed by the intellect. This, by the way, is also known as the rational appetite, which comes from Aristotle, to distinguish from the sensory appetites that we share with animals. Remember, Professor Sachs on Tuesday was talking about the distinction between, you know, our rational and our older brain circuitry, uh, which we share with, um, which, 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 which comes from evolution, uh, what we share with animals. So that's the intellect and the will. So following Aristotle, Aquinas argued that we need to, we need to cultivate the virtues. And virtues, virtues, remember, are the unfolding of capabilities. They are stable dispositions. They are habits oriented towards good acts. It's you use the intellect to discern the good, and then you use the will to choose the good. So acting, vice, acting on virtues leads to a good act, acting on, and the opposite of virtue is a vice, which are stable distributions ordered towards bad acts. And in theology, you would say, if you act on a vice, that's called a sin. Um, now, this can be a problem of the intellect or the will. You know, a defect of the intellect would be you choose something that you think is good, which is not really good. Um, you just get it wrong. But a defect of the will is, you know it's good, but you do it anyway. This is like Professor Sachs's example of eating the cake. You know this cake is not really good for me. I've already had a slice of cake, it's delicious, but I'm gonna have a second slice, even though I know I really shouldn't. So. You choose something that you know is not good for you. Or more technically, you choose a lower good over a higher good. Cake is a good. It's good. It tastes good. It's good. But it's not the highest good because the highest good is being moderate in your tastes and uh, taking care of your body and uh, not pumping it with sugar and all kinds of bad stuff. I love sugar, by the way. Yeah. Um, so intellect and will. You can make mistakes by thinking something is good when it actually isn't, or by knowing something is good and not pursuing the good anyway, because your weakness of the will, your weak will. That's literally what it means, your weak willed. So as we can see straight away, this feeds very directly into what Professor Sachs was talking about on Tuesday. Now, what are Following Aristotle then, Aristotle, sorry, Aquinas identifies seven virtues, four cardinal virtues, which habits that dispose us to achieve happiness in this life, and three theological virtues, which orient us to ultimate happiness, which is union with God. What are the 
the cardinal virtues. The cardinal virtues are prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice. So what does, uh, what, what, what does that mean? Well, prudence is basically what Aristotle meant by phronesis, practical wisdom. Professor Sachs talked a lot about this in his two lectures. It's the virtue whereby you discern what we should do in various contexts and choose the good. So in Aquinas' terms, you use the intellect and will, you discern what's the good in this particular context, and you direct the will towards the good in question. It's the most important probably of the cardinal virtues because it, it is the virtue which orients us to choose good economic outcomes. What about the others? Fortitude, or what um, uh, Aristotle called courage, allows us to overcome and respect our fears in terms of whatever good we're pursuing. And this perfects the sensory appetites. Temperance allows us to partake in the ordinary pleasures of life without being mastered by them. That's eating cake. Eating a slice of cake is an ordinary pleasure of life. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when you go too far, when you take that second or third slice of cake, when you know it's bad for you, that's being, you're mastered by it. And once again, temperance perfects the sensory appetites. The final cardinal virtue is justice. Justice is a very simple idea that says you give others what is their due. And so this is a social virtue oriented towards the common good. You give others what is their due, you take care of others, you look after their well-being. That's justice uh, for, um, for Tom. And that perfects the will to make the right choice and direct the will towards the good, in this case, the common good. Now, if we want to look at prudence, we can actually break this down even further. Whoops. There. Aquinas thought that there were actually eight parts to prudence. And I think that this is a little theologically obscure, but I think it helps to understand how you use practical reason to make good economic choices. Um, so Aquinas, so let's just go through them very quickly. This, by the way, can be found in Mary Hirschfeld's chapter. Um, the parts of, so memory is basically using your experience of what is good, using other experiences to find similar cases to what you're dealing with now from the past, identifying patterns or general trends of behavior from what you know took place in the past. That's memory. Understanding is the ability to know what something is, to recognize particulars. It's understanding, to know, to understand something is good or something is not good. Docility is discerning from the wisdom of others. Remember in virtue ethics, role models and teachers become very important. So docility is asking the question, what would a good person do in this particular circumstance? If docility is looking at other people, shrewdness is about discerning well for yourself, weighing a variety of factors to this properly discern the good, to be, be able to be, discern well for yourself. Reason in this particular context, this is a very specific context, is about being able to compare alternative possibilities and reason well from these premises to different conclusions. Again, reasoning well. Foresight is being able to anticipate the effects of what we choose today on our future actions and future contingencies. Like if I eat this cake, I could get diabetes. I could have these health issues, something like that. I, I'm able to have foresight. Caution 
is being alert to the way things can work against us, looking at what are the potential bad consequences of what I do here. And then circumspection is looking at all circumstances in play, recognizing complexity. That in other words, when you make a decision, um, there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of possible outcomes that you need to consider. Aquinas argued that they, they are the eight parts of prudence. Now, I think a lot of them tends to overlap, to be honest. Uh, a lot of them seem, seem to say the same thing. Um, but I think it's useful nonetheless for our perspective to look at this, to get a view as to what Aquinas was talking about when he talked about the absolute supreme importance of the virtue of prudence. Okay, so that's prudence. And that's the cardinal virtues. Let's go back to Aquinas. And we've done the parts of prudence. What about the theological virtues? The theological vir virtues are faith, hope, and charity. And to repeat what I said, they orient us towards ultimate happiness, which is union with God. Now, the, theolo the cardinal virtues can be acquired on their own through habit, through role models, through inculcation. The theological virtues... Aquinas argued that God has to do some work. In other words, the virtues are infused by grace. You need God to do some work to actualize the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Now, you might think that this is not that relevant for our course here because this is more theological. This is more about faith and hope and charity. And that's partly true. But Aquinas argued that there's a feedback mechanism whereby the theological virtues, especially charity, actually strengthen the cardinal virtues. So if you are a more charitable person, if you're a more loving person, then your ability to exercise prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance is better and is stronger. So this is Aquinas's twofold structure, which I think is very clever and, uh, and very internally consistent. Okay. Let's continue with, um, unless there are, let me just stop, the, let me just check and see, let me just stop the screen sharing. Are there any questions on anything I've done so far before I continue with Aquinas? Okay, let's continue with St. Thomas Aquinas. I'll go back to screen share. So, The dimensions of law. This is going. Um, this again. Bear with me as, as to where I'm going with this. Um, Aquinas argued that there are four dimensions of law: eternal law, natural law, human law, divine law. Eternal law is the plan of the universe and the mind of God. It's God's providential direction, guides and orders everything towards its proper purpose, the eternal law. That's all we need to think about that. The natural law is technically the participation of the human intact, intellect in the eternal law. So as rational beings, again, this is, a, this is what Aquinas meant by rational. We can be like God in our ability to understand the good, that's the intellect, and to choose the good, and that's the will. So by choosing good actions, including good economic actions, we are participating in the natural law, uh, so said Aquinas. And the natural law, the basic premise of the natural law is good is to be chosen and evil is to be avoided. And we use the virtue of practical reason to figure out what is good, what is not good, what are higher goods, what are lower goods, and to direct our will towards choosing the best good for us in particular circumstances. So we can, the natural law thinks that we can tell good from bad, we can tell right from wrong, even if we have defects of the intellect and the will. Remember, if we think something is good that's not really good, or if we know something is good, but we lack the will to choose it properly. 
um, which I think for us is probably the bigger defect. We all kind of know what's good for us in the economic realm, but we get tempted by things that we think will bring us happiness, but actually don't. So that's the eternal law and the natural law. What about the human law? Well, the human law applies these timeless principles of the natural law to the particular circumstances of our time and place. Uh, the positive law is the law that all political authorities make and judicial authorities uphold. That's the law. The law as we know it is the human law. And this requires the virtue of prudence because again, we're going from the general to the specific. We're applying general principles to specific circumstances. Now, this has a couple of important implications. And I'll just, even though it's not an economic one, I'll mention it because it's, it's an interesting one. Aquinas argued that if human laws violate the natural law, then they're not true laws at all and they have no moral authority. This, by the way, was the argument that Martin Luther King used, I believe in a letter from a Birmingham jail, when he argued that the uh, racist laws of segregation were, must, be, must not be obeyed because they have no moral authority, because they violate the natural law of the equal dignity of all human beings. So Aquinas, uh, his idea on law is directly relevant to us today. Um, he also argued that law cannot forbid all vices uh, because it's practically impossible. Take, for example, lying. We all know that lying is bad. Choosing to lie is to choose something that's not good. But you can't outlaw lying. It just would, wouldn't work. It would be impossible to do that. So there are certain things that the law, that there are certain uh, things that violate the law that nonetheless should not be outlawed by human law, I would say. And then finally, the final part is divine law, which is the part of the eternal law that's revealed through scripture, Aquinas said. And it's due to, to correct our misunderstandings of the natural law due to the defects of the intellect and the will. And so this can, and, and to help direct human beings to their supernatural end, which is union with God. And that's all I want to say about that, because that's um, the key purpose of why are we talking about law here? This is an, e an economics course, not a law course. Well, because the, the key point here is that the purpose of law for Aquinas is not just an external stick to make you do something. It's actually designed to instill and to strengthen virtue. In other words, you don't just obey the law for external reasons because you will get punished because if you, you will get punished if you don't do so, but you do so for internal reasons. You want to be a virtuous person. So the law helps inculcate virtue. That's a key point for Aquinas. And if you think about it, so for him, law, grace, and virtue are all connected. And because, you know, they're, therefore virtuous acts belong to the natural law. So they're all connected. So this distinction between doing something for an external reason and doing something for an internal reason turns out to be very important for economics. In economics, we are talking about um, in economics, we talk about, remember, rationality is you respond to incentives. I have more income, therefore I consume more goods. The price of one good increases over the price of another good, therefore I change my consumption decisions. But I'm doing it in response to an external stimulus. Not, it's not a law, but it's nonetheless an external financial incentive. Aristotle and Aquinas, on the other hand, say, if you're exercising the virtues, 
you're doing it for internal reasons. You're choosing something that's good, not because it's cheaper or because I'll get a jolt of satisfaction from it or for whatever other external reasons. You're doing it for internal reasons. Um, you're doing it for intrinsic reasons. You're doing it because you know it's aligned with virtue. And that brings to a distinction that Mary Hirschfeld makes in her book, which I think is very important. The distinction between maximization, as we see in neoclassical economics, and perfection, which is really what Aquinas is calling for. Aquinas is calling for perfection in the sense of, um, of, uh, of exercising the virtues to meet our natural end, eudaimonia, and our supernatural end, union with God. It's perfection. Um, economics, though, relies on incentives. Therefore, Hirschfeld argues, is a lower form of reason. It's basically untutored passions. It's, it's the passions. It's what Professor Sachs was talking about on Tuesday uh, and in his first week when he talks about, you know, Hume argued that reason is the slave of the passions. Modern economics really imbibes that view that you're acting on the, the choice set which comes from our sensory appetites that are untutored. In other words, the part that we share with animals. Um, you know, if you, if you give a dog a treat, the dog's immediate desire is to eat as much as possible. If, you, if, you, if you've ever had a dog, you'll know dogs can eat so much they make themselves sick because all they want is their immediate satisfaction and they don't think about the long term. They don't think about the consequences. They don't use reason because they're animals. Um, you can argue that rational choice theory is very similar. It, it treats people more like the dog who's trying to find a treat rather than a human being made in the image and likeness of God who can use reason to perfect the intellect and the will to live a life of virtue and to perfect those virtues. So in other words, it chooses maximization, getting as much as possible rather than perfection, being the best version of yourself and choosing, um, choosing what is good. So I, I, think, I hope that uh, distinction um, makes sense to you. Um, I think I will, yeah, I think um, I will come back to some of this. I, I'm going to skip over some of this because I'm running out of time and I want to get to the, the, the conclusion of this thing. Um, I will distinguish between, I'll do one more thing with Aquinas. He distinguished between natural wealth and artificial wealth. Now, natural wealth is basically I would say the material basis needed to live a good life and in community, including participation in the good life. It's the stuff you need to live eudaimonia, you know, food, clothing, housing, but also friendship, relationship. Um, some people might say to live a good life in the community, today you need a smartphone, whereas 30 years ago you didn't. So it's con it's Everything with Aquinas is context specific. But the key here is natural wealth is only a means to an end. And that, just like remember Aristotle said, wealth is only a means to an end. You have natural wealth because you want to live a good life. You want to achieve eudaimonia, human flourishing. Uh, but because our needs are limited, then the desire for natural wealth should be finite finite. Now, again, see how that differs from neoclassical economics, where our needs are basically seen as infinite. Because if, as long as you, you're only constrained by your money, if you had more and more and more money, you could buy more and more and more stuff, and you would never stop. Aquinas said there comes a point where you do stop because our needs are finite. Artificial wealth is basically money. And he argued that this is kind of two levels down. If natural wealth is oriented towards human flourishing, then artificial wealth 
is ordered towards natural wealth, which in turn is ordered towards a good life of virtue, human flourishing. And so in other words, the only point of money is to get the things you need to live a good flourishing life. Now, Aquinas argued that this is double dangerous because the desire for artificial wealth can be infinite. Your desire for more wealth can go on forever without, without increasing. Whereas, and we see like, um, if you look at some of the billionaires today, you, you wonder like, what can you do with a hundred billion dollars? Um, they always, and a lot of people seem to want more. And there comes a point where you say, well, what is enough? Um, Neoclassical economics can't ask that question because there's no such thing as what well is enough. But the tradition of Aquinas and Aristotle can very clearly ask what is enough. Let me summarize this talk by saying, what are the weaknesses of rational choice theory in light of what we have seen from Aquinas and also through Aristotle, because I hope, I hope you've realized now that Aristotle, that Aquinas is basically taking Aristotle and Christianizing it. But a lot of what is in Aquinas is already there in Aristotle. So when we talk about prudence, the importance of the virtue of prudence, it's probably Aquinas's analysis is more sophisticated than Aristotle, but it's pretty much there in what Aristotle said was phronesis. It's pretty much there. Um, I think there are a number of weaknesses of rational choice theory. Uh, let's talk about them. This is a, a summary point to summarize this, this, this lecture. Um, what are the weaknesses of rational choice theory based on what we now know from the thought of Aristotle and Aquinas? from the virtue-infused approach to making good economic choices. The first problem, I would argue, is that it's predicated on self-interest. My utility comes from my income, my choosing of consumption, my choosing of goods and services. It doesn't come from your utility. Um, you are not, it's possible to design a fancy utility function whereby you put somebody else's utility in yours so that you get happy when they get more stuff. That's possible. And a neoclassical economist would come back with that retort and say, it's not just about self-interest. You can put anything in the utility function. There is something to that, but only a small thing. You're, you're never willing... You're, you're, if somebody else's happiness is in your utility function, let's say I put, I get happy when you get more cake because I love cake. And if you have more cake, I get happy from that. That's, I'm getting a jolt. It's ultimately still about my jolt of satisfaction. It's not altruism. I'm not willing to sacrifice something of benefit to me to help you. It's still fundamentally based on self-interest. Uh, and it's very different from uh, the view of the common good that we see from both Aristotle and Aquinas. The second problem, and we've been through this many times, is that preferences are subjective. There's no sense of an objective good that reason and virtue direct us to choose. You like what you like. Utility is subjective. Utility has a view of happiness that's hedonistic. There is no concept of perfection. There's only maximization. There's no concept of ethical education, of tutoring your passions. Rather, neoclassical economics is based on the premise that it's just not possible to compare preferences across people. So all that matters is what they buy on the market. We saw that. You cannot, as Professor Sachs says, you cannot question somebody's preferences because their preferences are sovereign and sacrosanct. And anything that is legal is a valid preference. You know, tobacco products, luxury goods that are fueled by advertising rather than true needs, uh, 
gambling, the feeding of addictions, anything that's legal is, is, is fair game. And making good economic choices is about much more than that. It's about trying to figure out what is good, or as Aquinas would say, using the intellect to discern what is good and using the will to choose what is good. But that means you have to have a concept of what is good for the human person. The third issue is what only, only that all that matters is goods and services you can buy on the market. Um, it can't accommodate the goods that come from human relationships, a sense of meaning, a purpose, and achievement, um, a sense of appreciation of nature, spiritual goods, religious goods, cultural goods. Anything you can't buy is, in a sense, ruled out uh, by, the, by this. And that is clearly not what human flourishing is all about. Human flourishing is much more holistic uh, than stuff you can buy in the market. Fourth point, and again, it repeats what I've said already, but it bears repeating because it's such an important point. Wants are unbounded. We maximize our utility. But the virtue ethics tradition of Aristotle and Aquinas says that that is not in accord with human nature. And instead, our desires should be bounded, our needs should be limited, and lower goods should be subordinated to higher goods. Perfection and maximization are different things. And the fifth point is that peoples can be excluded. This, I'm ending basically where I started. This neoclassical economics rational choice theory is a utilitarian theory. Therefore, just as the individual goods differ, so does the common good. You're adding up utilities. So somebody can have a lot more than somebody else. Somebody can have, if you, if you have a total of 100, that could mean person one has 50 and person two has 50. Or it could mean person one has 100 and person two has zero. For a utilitarian, for adding up utilities, it doesn't matter whether you have uh, example one or example two. Uh, all that matters is your total utility is 100. But that's not what the common good is. The common good does not allow one person to have 100 and somebody else to have zero, because that's not looking after the well-being of, of everybody in society. Um, but Pareto efficiency does allow that. It does, allow, and utilitarianism more generally does allow that. It allows people to be excluded. Stop share. Okay. It is 11.15 on the dot. Um, as always on Friday, I will stay around to take questions. I'll stay uh, as much as I'm needed. I'll stay up to noon if you want me to. But um, so if you want to ask me any questions or discuss anything, um, stick around. If you'd rather do it privately, send me an email and we can do a private chat. Uh, I'm happy to do that too. But this is technically, we can technically have office hours here. Um, just allow me to take a short, take a couple of seconds to take a, a bio break, and then I will come back uh, and take questions. So if you have questions, stick around. If not, uh, we'll see you next week with Professor Sachs on Tuesday when we'll be talking about the next subject, which is a very interesting subject. It's going to be different theories of social justice. Um, you'll want to be, you'll want to hear that. That's going to be good. Uh, at least Professor X with, I might not be very good. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a quick break. Thank you all. Have a good Friday. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Stay happy. Stay happy in a eudaimonistic sense, not a hedonistic sense. Um, and I will see you all, uh, next week or stick around if you want me to. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a nice weekend. Professor Stoner.
you're you're on mute. Here, let me see if I can unmute you. No, I can't. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hello. It looks like everybody's gone. Everybody, everybody ran away. Should we uh, should we drop off and go to FaceTime, or do you have you have anything for Jeff? Um, I did have I did have one question, but maybe you can answer it, and then he doesn't need to answer it. No, I think I won't even try. But what's the question? Well, it, he did this really good summary between between Aquinas's views and Aristotle's views. So, prudence, phrenesis, fortitude, courage, justice, common good. What's the Arist Aristotelian? for um, temperance? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I do understand the theological basis of temptation, though. I, I understand the real world of temptation. <laughs> well, the theological... Hi, hi, welcome back, Tony. Well, everybody's taking off, and Hello. we're just teasing ourselves for a few moments. The theological basis of temptation is that if God hadn't wanted us to give us temp wanted us to yield to temptation, she wouldn't have given us temptation in the first place. <laughs> uh, maybe God gave us temptations to basically allow us to maximize to to perfect our natures. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be very boring. Otherwise, we'd be very boring people. Anyway. Professor, Enjoy. thank you again. Thank you again for a great class. Um, oh, I, my I, question, hope that was useful. Yeah, I hope it was useful and wasn't too theological for the students. I don't know. I thought it was amazing. Oh, thank I, you. I, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's theological at all. I think. I think you're positing two two completely separate views, yeah. and each one is running its course. And to that end, you did this really good thing between prudence and phrenesis, the the Aristotelian and what Aquinas took over and fortitude, courage. Um, what is the Aristotelian for temperance? Uh, I think it's, I think it's temperance. I'm not sure actually. I think it might temperance. just be the same thing. It might just be the same thing. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, you know, Arist Aristotle's list of virtues was much longer. It wasn't just the cardinal virtues. You I mean, Jeff showed uh, some of that in his chart. It's like, and Aristotle was very clear that this is an incomplete list. It's just basically a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, no that problem. was my only question. No, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you all for, uh, for sitting in on this. Uh, uh, it's an honor to have all of you here. Well, it's, it's, it's great. It's great. It's, uh, it's something, it's something I look forward to in my week. <laughs> Very okay, much. I need to try and get the students to talk more. I have to think, I have to think, um, think a little bit about that. Yeah. The technology is really hard. The technology is hard. And, and one thing I noticed is when they saw that I was asking questions, they started turning off their cameras and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like no. <laughs> Well, it's it's really. Oh, it's, thanks it's, so much. James and I are going to go off and do a um, conversation about the problem project we're working on. I want to thank you a lot, uh, Tony. Okay, no problem. This program is really great. Okay, no problem, James. Uh, James and Jim, thank you very much, uh, Barbara, and um, we'll see you next week. Okay. Great. Thank yep. you again. Take, Take care. Bye bye. Care. Bye. Night.